So it's really my privilege to have this uh, symposium. I must say, sort of personal note is that I come from a family of biologists whose interest is originally was really in evolution, plant evolution, but also human evolution. And I went to brain science, and I always wanted to find a link between this. And, and here's an, uh, personally a unique uh, privilege for me to be able to get people from these different disciplines together. So uh, I'm really eager to hear what you have to say. So our first talk today is by Nama Goren, who's from the Department of Archaeology. And uh, I think you'll hear some fascinating stuff. I won't say more than that. So Nama, welcome. Good morning. I think my brain was tested this morning in this building. I'm not sure I'm a homo sapiens because it took me quite a long time to find the hole. You came from uh, Mount Scopus. <laughs> what were we talking about? <laughs> well, uh, this morning I would like to talk to you about uh, cognition, evolution, and memory of early humans without finding any single human. So this is kind of a, a little complicated. Um, it would be nice if we could turn off the lights over here and uh, see some of the... I um, will present a very limited aspect of the project that I'm engaged with. Uh, maybe it's not nice to say how many years. Uh, over, over 20 years, easy. And um, I would like to show you how we can speak about technology, knowledge and memory of early hominins. And I would like to take you on a trip to the Hula Valley, to the northern part of the Jordan Valley, and show you what we actually know about it. We speak about a, a, a hominin that uh, you can see here a, a reconstruction, a, a scientific reconstruction of its face. Uh, this guy is uh, Homo erectus. And when I speak about Homo erectus, I speak about Homo erectus and his contemporaries. And as, as you read in the most prestigious uh, uh, journals, you see that uh, once in a while we have a new discovery of uh, a new hominin type. And I'm sure that you all will give a, a much more, a, a better uh, presentation for this. <coughs> um, Homo erectus and his associates, but Homo erectus is very important. Uh, he first appears on the scene uh, around 1.8 million years ago in Africa. And he is also the first one to go out of Africa and to go all the way to uh, Java in a relatively uh, a short time uh, span. Um, the faculties that enable this type of hominin to go out of Africa are considered to be the large brain in comparison with Australopithecines and other types of hominins that were uh, uh, that had, uh, of course, uh, less abilities than this uh, type uh, of hominin. And uh, this um, hominin type in Africa and uh, away of Africa is associated with a, a culture that we call an Achelian culture, even though in places like Georgia it is associated with other cultures, uh, not Achelian. In my lecture, I will devote it today to the Achelian culture and to a single uh, site which is located in the upper Jordan Valley. What do we know about the uh, length of time that these uh, hominins uh, had, um, were active and left some, you know, <coughs> some remains of the material culture all over the place? Uh, the left one is not uh, terribly accurate because now we, we sh it should continue to 1.76 million. Uh, in Israel, the earliest evidence for the activity of this hominin type is at the site of Ubudia, and it is considered to be 1.6 uh, million years. And these are two sites. Uh, uh, Ubudia is the first site that we see some kind of a, a, an African influence, African, actually African culture that is uh, found in many uh, places in East Africa and also in other places, in South Africa and other places. The duration of this hominin in, in, in our area is of course uh, quite a long time as you've seen in the previous slide. 
And uh, I just would like you to pay attention to the map that you see on the right hand side. And this is a depiction of all the places in Israel where hand access, one of the hallmarks of this Sashalian culture, were found. We have over 360 individual sites and the um, map uh, shows you the, uh, the density of the hand access. Well, the sites are having a lot of different uh, artifacts, uh, stone artifacts, we call them lithic artifacts, but uh, the size of the circles uh, depict the number of hand access that were found in each site. And this is by uh, collecting and this is by excavation. Of course, the potential is much, much higher. We would concentrate on the site of Gesher Bunot Yaakov. Uh, that was found uh, many years ago in the, in the 30s of last century. And I don't have time to go into the history of research, which is quite uh, fascinating. Um, Three expeditions excavated there. The first one was uh, Professor Dor Dorothy Gerod, uh, who did a, a test pit in 1930s and decided that she doesn't want to continue. She didn't find things in situ and she was uh, disappointed. Then uh, Professor uh, Steckelis continued with the help of the geologist Professor Picard and others. And uh, they have excavated uh, north of the bridges. Here are the bridges. Here are the bridges, and they were excavating none of the bridges on this part of the uh, bank. Uh, oh, this is, of course, the Jordan River, and the Hula is uh, over here. And what is uh, of interest for, for us excavators is that whatever you see, well, we found out that the site is uh, is very long one, is, is actually of an African dimension, about 3.5 kilometers of a site on an axis north to south. Uh, we don't know what was the, the length and what, what we uh, reconstructed is actually we are on the southernmost tip of the ancient Hula Lake and the Hula Lake is oscillating, I'll show you in a minute. And uh, this is the, uh, we have done here tiny little holes and these holes produce the fantastic uh, archives of uh, paleontology, paleobotany, uh, archaeology, uh, sedimentology and many other things. The problem of the site is uh, that it is uh, underlying the Jordan River over here and this part, the eastern part of east of the Jordan River, we have the uh, Saudia Plate and on the west part of the Jordan we have the Sinai Plate and these two plates are bouncing against each other and causing all the sediments of the sites to be tilted by heavy tectonics and we had to invest all kinds of uh, particular systems how to cope with these tilted uh, um, horizons, archaeological horizons. I think Joel and I had long uh, experience at the site of Ubudia and that gave us actually a background how to deal and, and uh, have a more sophisticated excavations uh, over here. So everything that you fi we found here and in the other layers uh, this is what we base our uh, analysis and the discussions uh, that we will hear today. Um, we have exposed 34 meters thick uh, of the ancient uh, Paleo Hula. And from top to bottom of these 36 meters, we have indications that the Acheleans were there and produced the Achelian material culture. Uh, on from oops sorry from the top ooh, from the top <coughs> to about this part we have about 15 archaeological sites that are superimposed one on top of the other and each of them yielded a lot of material we are very fortunate because at this point bm we found the uh, uh, matuyama bruns uh, boundary uh, zone, which means that everything on, on top of the green line is uh, the paleomagnetic palomagne uh, orientation is normal and everything below this line, the paleomagnetic, is reversal. And that means that this point exactly is 0 0.78 million years old. And this is, of course, a global phenomenon everywhere that uh, scientists uh, 
um, find the Bruns Matuyama boundary crown, that's exactly, it gives exactly the same date. So this was, we were able to pinpoint what is the sequence of Achillean sites that we have excavated here, rich in uh, bifaces. I would like just to add that we have done two drillings and we found out that the whole package of these sediments that you see here, which the, depicts the transgressions and ingressions of the Lake Hula, the whole package is sitting on 80 meters of basalt flows, uh, and the top of the basalt flows are dated to 1.1, 1.3 million years. So this is actually bracketing uh, the, the formation, the Geshe of Notio, the Notio <coughs> formation to uh, um, and, and he gives us actually a, a very nice chronological order where these hominins in the Hula Valley, where they were active and what they did. And um, I wouldn't go into other uh, details, except that all these sites you'll see later, I think that's a, enough uh, <coughs> composition. The goal of anthropology is to reconstruct human behavior. And reconstructing human behavior without the humans is a little bit a uh, tough job. <laughs> so what I uh, decided to do today is to take you all to the upper Jordan Valley and to tell you that this morning we're going to kill an elephant. Now, killing an elephant is not, uh, nowadays is a rare phenomenon, but during these times in the, in the early middle Pleistocene, this was co quite a common phenomenon. You can see here on the uh, left side all the different layers that yielded archaeological material. Each of these is actually a site. And you can see the row of animals on top. And you can see that hippos were very, very dominant animal in the diet of early humans. You can see that deer uh, was very, yachmu, was very dominant uh, component of the diet. And you can see that elephant, elephant remains is, was even more uh, common. So my selection of killing an elephant this morning is not uh, out of the blue, but it is based on, on a sequence of layers in which each of these layers produce some fragments of the elephant. Please uh, take into consideration that the excavations were extremely limited in space and therefore uh, sometimes I find a fragment of a tooth, a fragment of a tusk, other times I found a patella, a patella the, the kneecap of an elephant is a little thing like this, yeah? So it depends on the size of the hole. On top of the elephant that the skull that I found in the, one of the layers, we found uh, this biface, the hallmark of the Achillean culture. And this biface and all the others, uh, over uh, quite a number of them, actually give us the abilities to reconstruct the cognitive, the evolution, and the memory of these uh, people. And let's see how we can do it. Uh, just two more pictures of the, of the hand access. Um, most of the hand access at GBY are done on basalt. <coughs> basalt, which is very common both in Korazim Saddle, in the Golan Heights, and even in, in the Western Galilee. So I wouldn't go into uh, specifics. It's much more difficult to produce a hand access of basalt but the hominins also produced very few number of, of, uh, of hand access made on flint, I'll show you one later, and also on limestone. So, but the, the mass production, the hallmark of the culture, uh, was made on basalt. And what do, how do we reconstruct what we are going to find? In order to make a hand access of basalt, we have to go through different steps that will enable us at the end to produce the target when the target is, is a handex. And the target is very important because if you think of a carcass of an elephant, and I don't know if you ever saw pictures how people uh, dissect an elephant or cut an elephant or, or process an elephant, this is a huge mass. And actually the work has to be done quite uh, quickly because of the toxin, uh, the temperature, everything that goes in it before uh, humans can uh, eat it. So the first thing that they done, uh, they went to get the raw material. To get the raw material, 
you have to have something in your brain. You have to have a plan in your brain and you have to know what will be the steps, the different steps that will lead you from the outcrop of the basalt, from the basalt flow, all the way to the elephant and the biface uh, hendex next to it. So acquisition of raw material is very important. Then they, what they've done, they have extracted slabs about 40, sometimes 50 centimeters thick uh, slabs of uh, basalt that come from particular part of the flow. I'll show it in a minute. Then the, the, these this, um, slabs are pretty large. When they are totally exhausted, they are about 20 kilos. So the hominins that took them out of the uh, flow, uh, th the pieces were very big. I have no idea what is the size of it and none of the geologists who know the Golan Heights and this area w weren't able to help me. Uh, from these slabs they fragmented it and from each fragment they modified a core. A core is the parent material from which later on they napped or, or gave below and produced a, a flake and this flake later on were modified and was made a handex and with this handex they made the function and after the function there is the, the procedure of discard. They, they left it on the surface or sometimes they took it away if they found out that they want. So this, what you see here, all these items are not a theoretical background. This is the archaeology that is found and can be proved. The bottom line <coughs> is the theoretical. So the biface reduction sequence is evident from the lithic assemblages that we have. But this leads us to the biface chaine operatoire. The term chaine operatoire uh, means that this is the entire procedure from the incipient thought that you're going to need uh, to make a biface all the way and everything that it necessitates, all the language, communication and memory that we do not see in the stones and but uh, at the end we can come into uh, this thing. So the, our methodology is uh, uh, very simple. We do the uh, attribute analysis of the lithic uh, artifacts. We do experiments, actualistic experiments, in order to understand how things were done, how things were uh, napped. And then finally, we use uh, ethnographic uh, analogy. The ethnographic analogy uh, uh, derived from hunter-gatherers, extant hunter-gatherers, is very important because it shows us what similar communities of modern humans, of course, but are, are doing and what parallels or how can we draw some important uh, information. Uh, some of the slides that you'll see um, are on the right, on the left hand side will, you'll have the Achillean uh, photo and on the right hand side you have the recent, uh, um, the recent uh, ethnography of uh, people from the Irianjaya uh, uh, making by facial tools. You know, they have axes and edges and each person, each man is walking around with an X or an edge and the technology of production is extremely similar uh, by analogy to what we are seeing at the site. So first of all, the origin of the slabs is from the middle part, the middle sector of the uh, basalt flow. And in this middle sector you have an, a zone which is fractures laterally and produces these slabs of basalt that they have extracted. You can see here at the bottom one of the slabs and don't uh, be misled by the smallness of the thing. Its uh, weight is, is, <laughs> is fantastic, it's, it's pretty um, heavy. Now, the, and the, the, the knowledge of these people was so that they understood that this part of the flow is the most important part because it has no vesicles in it, no bubbles of gas in it, and it's the hardest and the toughest material that they can uh, work on. I brought here uh, uh, the analogy from Irianjaya. Uh, they know the location of 
the particular quarries for generations, and this was dated by carbon-14 and, and other means, we don't know where the flows from which the GBY hominins took the material, this is, uh, we don't know it, because the land uh, transformation by erosion, by accretion, by different things, caused us, you know, to mask actually the, the initial quarries. I just would uh, like to mention the fact that in recent surveys in uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, lots of sites, Ashelian sites of the same time periods were found, and you could see the location of uh, the dikes in which they were uh, quarrying the material and everything is left there uh, more or less on the surface. So hominins knew where to go, what is the best material, and they also uh, transferred this information from generation to generation because I failed to mention that the package of bifaces in the stratigraphic order that I showed you represents about 50,000 years. The entire sequence of 34 meters represents 100,000 years, but the section of the, the sites 50,000 years. So the information of where to go and how to look for this material moved from generation to generation for 50,000 years because they are doing in each archaeological horizon the same things, yeah, the, technologically. Uh, in the previous pictures you saw uh, a lever. Maybe I should uh, just go back. You see the lever, they, they build the fire here, and I'll show you that the hominins uh, GBY had fire. They build the fire here and they use the lever to crack open the, the, the rock. We know it from a much later period that they, this is a very helpful uh, means to crack open a, a, um, smooth faces of rock. Okay, so the, the injury that the levers caused to, to these rocks are depicted here. And of course, later on, they, they take it out. And then they start a big process of fragmentation. Because as I said, you cannot have these huge things and handle them appropriately. You have to fragment them. And just notice how similar the, the fragments, the shapes of the fragments from the, uh, the Papuans and uh, the GBY ones. Here, I present a core. After fragmentation, the fragment is being worked, and at the end it is ready a, a, as apparent material to produce the flakes on which the hand excess will be later shaped. So this is a procedure which is taking place a time after another. A, you have the surface here where a flake was detached from here, another big flake was detached from here, and these big flakes were were turned into, were modified into bifaces. I just wanted to show you the edge of the core in order to understand that the whole mechanism, that the ability of hominins to crack open the stone is built on angular angles. If you have an angle, you can crack the stone open. You can crack a stone like this with a bone, even though the basalt is very strong. You can crack it with um, antler, and you can crack it with, uh, of course, with the stone. But the whole, the, the key to this is the, uh, the angle. And I think all of you, or most of you, are aware that uh, a few, few months ago, I think, there was a, a, an article in Science uh, reporting that uh, the first industries that were found um, in East Africa are dated now to 3.3 million years. So the knowledge of how to crack open the stones is continuous through the evolution of different hominin types from 3.3 million years onwards. Okay, so we reached the stage of this uh, uh, course and now we extract flakes. The flakes can have a shape which is ready to be transformed into a biface, like the two examples that you can see here. But there are other shapes that are not uh, the same, not pointed, and they have a straight end tip 
and these were formed into another type of, of a biface tool called cleavers, but I would not uh, speak today about uh, these cleavers. Here on the left hand side you can see how a flint handex is looking like, and the picture on the right hand side is of extreme importance because in ethnography you can listen to what the people are talking. And what you see here is a series of experts. Experts because they are um, flaking um, volcanic material which is much more difficult than um, sedimentary rocks or flint or, or, or agate or any other thing. And the important thing in the process of this, uh, what these people are doing is the talk. They are talking co constantly. They, they have a language, of course, they are modern humans, they live in Papua New Guinea. We don't know about the means of communication with the hominins, but we, we know one thing, that if a person takes a lump, a, a flake, and he wants to transfer it into a biface, it's not a mechanical thing. It's not like a, a mechanical thing because it is based on a blow evaluation, blow evaluation, blow evaluation, and so on and so forth. So the napper is actually evaluating the results of each of the blows that he is inflicting on the object. And by mimicking, Nobody can produce the same thing. There were lots of American universities that tried to take students, put them on a little island, we don't have uh, these facilities, yeah, put them on a little island and tell them to, to show a picture of Handex, give them a Handex in hand and say, okay, now you go ahead and you make this tool. No way. Nobody is capable of doing it. You can mimic, but you can mimic only to a particular level and uh, to reach the, uh, the goal, uh, you cannot. Uh, there were also many experiments comparing the experts to the non-experts and seeing how things can uh, develop this way uh, or another. So basically, I, th I believe language was part of the properties of these early humans. And the evaluation that you can see here where he naps this, this is uh, something that is accumulative uh, uh, knowledge. <coughs> and this accumulative knowledge is tra being transferred from one generation to the other generation because the tools are the same, the, the, the shapes are the same, and the technology at GBY is the same. Um, in this picture here, um, when we exposed it, we said, okay, we reached Africa. This is a, actually a pavement made of handexes and cleavers. You never see anything like this, perhaps except one uh, place in Spain. You never see something like this, only in Africa. In Africa, you can see there are descriptions of people driving over 20 kilometers on a rag, which is made of bifaces like this. Okay, so when we exposed it, we were very um, enthusiastic about it and we said, this is another trait of the origin of, uh, of these people because the fact that something, um, they had a necessity or a desire to produce so many tools and stack them in, in one place. And uh, the experiments that we had showed us that this is not a simple configuration, a simple configuration of the bifaces, and that a lot of things were carried in to the site and out of the site. So the mobility, the factor of mobility in the ancient hominids of the Hula Valley is a very important one. The fact that we don't know where else they went and where were other sites that they inhabited, we don't know any of the contemporary sites. We are sure that they existed because genetically they could not have been an isolated community only there for a hundred thousand years. This is, this is unheard of, of course. So transportation, how people took pl uh, the artifacts from one place to another is uh, very important. The core of the biface modification is the large flakes and through our study 
we came to uh, conclude that they use different methods. There are about five different methods encountered at the site that produced large flakes. And we don't have many cores for each, and sometimes only one, but we can present the different things when we all remember that the goal of each of the method was to produce a large flake in order to modify it into a, a handex. One thing we should discuss about technology is that the, when you start with a large basalt slab, and then you fragment it. You need a lot of force in order to do it, in order to give the blow to the material that the material will crack open. You can see here one of our colleagues on the right hand side carrying a hammerstone, if you like, yeah, a percussor, a hammerstone that weighs over 30 kilos. Uh, you can see here the gender issue, me going with the, a hammerstone that is appropriate for my size at that time. Now I probably would need a bigger one. <laughs> and uh, you can see here also the segregation of the different um, uh, uh, hammers. You can see in blue the hammers. You can see the potential hammers. And we did not see the evidence that it was used. But one has to take into consideration that if you give two, three, four blows, you don't necessarily see the impact on the hammer. But if you are using it more extensively, so we put items that were foreign to the lake margin, we put them together here. And then you can see also the, the, the green one is split percusses. When you give a blow and the blow split the, the hammer, uh, it's a very uh, indicative split, so we can recognize it and we can uh, see that it was done like this. These people were more sophisticated than just collecting different appropriate sizes of hammerstones because they also used antler. Antler, we have uh, at the site three types of uh, deer and they used one type. And this is the experimental um, uh, antler and you can see that uh, it, it, it is damaged at the end where it gives, a, a, where the blow harms the antler. Here is the GBY one, three quarters of a million years old, maybe not too, too well visible, but it's here it's okay uh, to show you that they were alternating the different uh, uh, hammers while they're producing. They start with a very big one and then go to a miniature thing at the end. And you can see that these very thin flakes, you see, look at this. This is two centimeters. Look at the thin flakes. These are a typical product of an antler hammer, uh, which is uh, in, an innovation at this time um, in, in human uh, uh, development. <coughs> The flowchart summarizes everything that hominidans did at GBY with basalt. I have explained and showed that they had to acquire the raw material. And I have described only this part, this part of how one goes about making a biface. And I spoke also a little bit about percussors over here. But there are other things that they have done with basalt and other very different things. And selecting very different materials of the basalt. We're going to publish in the 19th an article in uh, Philosophical Transaction of the Royal Society, uh, which is dedicated only to anvils. And ev anvils are uh, playing a major role. You can. Uh, uh, deal with the carcass of the elephant by uh, uh, cutting it with a hand axe. But if you want to crack open bones of animals and eat the marrow, which was a delicatess, uh, which everybody had at that time period, if you want to crack open nuts that grew in the hula, hard nuts, if you wanted to do something with the, uh, with the wood or with the skin, then you need an anvil because you're living on the muddy surfaces of the hula. And this needs, of course, uh, something to go between the mud <coughs> and the object. So just by this chart, you can see 
And remember that I have similar charts for the flint, different tools, different mechanism, different approach, and I have charts for the limestone. Different tools, different mechanism, different things. I didn't think that I should bore you with all these details, but just to give you an idea that this is, the thought is, is being here. The acquisition of the raw material is here, but the end of, the, of this uh, uh, flowchart is the target object of the tools. And sometimes the procedure is quite a, a complicated one. I uh, want to show one comparison between what we, we uh, found in this uh, horizon, which I've shown you the picture before. We found 203 bifaces, zero giant cores, and uh, above 1,000 flakes. Because of our experiments, we could have um, expected, uh, we could have come with expected values. We should have found 20 giant cores to produce 233 uh, bifaces and a minimum of 20,000 flakes, of which we found, you know, 1,000. So uh, this gives us a hint that what we see and what we document on the archaeological horizons is just a, a tiny little fraction of the activity that these hominins used to have along the shores of, uh, of the Hula and the sophisticated thing. We have also registered and uh, explained and um, published extensively on the fire uh, that in every single archaeological horizon we have indications for fire. Fire also means a lot in terms of cognitive abilities. Fire means a lot in terms of the culture. Fire means a lot uh, in terms of how people uh, treated their, um, their diet, their nutrition. Uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, this is an am amelioration of the, of the nutrition and uh, uh, many other uh, aspects. And this table, uh, this graph shows you the different tools in blue, these are the bifaces and the cores and the, the gray is the mass is the waste, what we call waste, everything which prehistorians do not treat as tools. The important thing is that you can see here all the levels from the top, the youngest to the oldest. And basically it's a very conservative uh, ambiance, a conservative uh, in a way that the same tools appear all through, the same technology appear all through. So we assume that there is a connection between the populations, the palo populations, and the difference are functional. Sometimes we found many bones, other times we didn't find any bones, other times we found a lot of organic material, other times uh, we found only waste of something that was taken uh, away. But this, all these things together actually show us that uh, what was written years ago, uh, that the tempo of cultural change in the uh, early Pleistocene is uh, going very slowly. These are the cognitive abilities that were deciphered from the archaeological ethnographic analogy and the experimental archaeology in order to actually to bring uh, us into a better understanding of the Shen Operatoire. So all these aspects that I was, I was describing basically are concerned by other archaeologists as, as signature of modernity. But could we say that the uh, uh, Homo erectus were modern people? I don't know. At least I can say that they had all these things that we were describing here uh, in front of you. I thank you very much. I'm an, an ignorant in language. I have no idea. But if you take into consideration 
all the aspects. And people say, okay, uh, birds know how to go somewhere and how to build a nest and all this. Okay, but these people knew how the hippo behaves, all this and this. How, where are the flint? Where, where is this? How you go about this? When you come? How to, the, uh, we, we described in the past their understanding of anatomy, of the animal anatomy. They knew how to open a carcass of a deer, just as modern humans that we have from archaeological sites in the, in the Western Galilee doing the same. So I think it was complex, but I cannot say anything about it. I really don't know. Sorry. Another question, if I may. How many steps do you have when you are doing, when you are preparing the, the final tour? How many steps do you go from the core, from the the general steps I have presented here, but when you take a, a when you take a, a flake and you start napping it, each blow is a step. Yeah. So this is the changing up to a hundred. It could be up to a hundred, but uh, one should say that this uh, African uh, tradition uh, is a minimalistic one and they go uh, for a particular part of the flake to thin them and then they do minimal shaping, but the quite a number of steps. Yeah, please go. How much diversification do you see over this long period? Diversification in what? <coughs> they are very similar. There, there is a variability because when you deal, this is not a, a line, you know, a production line of, of a, a factory. But uh, uh, all over, if, if you look at all the statistical uh, elements, you see that the similarity is very high. Yeah, but what, what could have maintained the uniformity over such huge distance? And we call it tradition. The tradition. If you go to a, I don't know, to a, a little valley <coughs> in, a, in a, the, the high Alps and you look at the sickle blades, the sickle blades are looking the same. You can have a handle difference, you can have this and that, but in general, because, uh, because it is moved or transferred from one generation to the other, the similarity is very big. Is all tradition enough, or do they have to bring an example to show how to do it? This, I don't know. What is evident is that you have better experts and less experts, mm -hmm. okay? We, this we can see. And you can have rejects, because even a good napper can sit and a fly comes sit on top of his or something bigger, and then, you know, he gives the, the wrong blow and then everything uh, cracks. And he has to start from the beginning. How long does it take for a modern human to uh, The experiments that were done in East Africa, from the minute that you have uh, the blade, the, the, the flake, 3.5 minutes to produce a tool like this. That's a very short learning. No, no. Not learning. No, no, I'm saying how, how long does it take to acquire the, ah, the, this, skill, the skill? This I don't know. Oh. This yeah. I, I don't know. I, I have a, a, some idea, but. but I, I want to touch on that because you mentioned language, and I think that the proof you had for the, the, the fact that they use language is that you cannot do this by imitation. But clearly, if you had, I don't know, students or someone tried to do this by imitation, they did this in a day, maybe a month, but they haven't had years of experience. Maybe, you know, the skill that it takes is years of experience. So maybe imitation, you know, through a long period of time is enough for you to, to acquire I'll give you, this. I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you, you an expert and you see what he's doing and yeah. you're just trying this. I'll, I'll give you an example, two, two things and notes and then I'm yes. off. Um, a colleague of mine, uh, Jacques Pellegrin, is trying to imitate leaves, uh, some kind of uh, points that are typical for European uh, culture uh, 17,000 years ago, which is called um, Solutrean. I think it took him 35 years to, to reach the, but these are very sophisticated things, but 35 years, about 35 years to reach a good craftsmanship. Is this his job? <laughs> a baby? Well, he started, he started from medicine and then he moved into an interesting thing. Okay, so 35 uh, years. But the point, th there is a point in what you yeah. say, is that in every ethnographic hunter-gatherer community that you see, 
children start to, to imitate from a very young age. So if uh, you go to Eskimos, the, the kids, three years old, already have a tiny little bow, and, and also the same with the Khoisan in the Kalahari and, and no, matter, no matter where else. But they start and, and then they start to imitate. And with imitation, they start to listen to the adults. And after a while, they experiment and so on and so forth, because this is a community, community, community effort. Thank Any you. Other questions? Yeah. So, uh, when you gave the students or the people a mo model or an example and they tried to imitate, what was missing? What fine tuning was missing in, the, in the, their product that it wasn't functional? The understanding of how to give the blow and what is the purpose of the blow in order to achieve the final thing. It comes in two stages. It, it reduces the, the air, the size, but it also has to keep the very thin edges. And this is the very complicated, the symmetry and the regularity. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Okay, so uh, the title is Monkey Math and Human Language. Uh, whoops, one second. Um, there are a couple of observations which are even below trivial. One is that animals communicate and so do we. And the second one, and I'm quoting Lewontin, Richard Lewontin, whose paper on the evolution of cognition is something that I keep in mind whenever I think about such things. Uh, the second observation is that it's trivially true that human cognition and language evolved. There's just like no debate about it. I mean, the puzzle is that only humans seem to have language, and the question is, can its evolutionary roots can ever be traced? There are skeptics, such as Lewontin, who think that this is a hopeless endeavor, and I have to admit that until today, I've never even come close to even, you know, presenting anything about it, because I very much share this type of sentiment. Um, but still there's hope that we might be able to get some ideas here and there and some results, you know, some scattered results that would give us at least a glimpse on how linguistic communication evolved. And maybe there's something in what I'll be telling you in, in the next 25 or 30 minutes um, that might remotely resemble something of that kind. Uh, so the basic idea here is to look at how the perception and representation of quantity uh, uh, in both monkeys and humans, whether these, these kinds of abilities are related. And the idea is basically to look at some details and see if we can make something out of them. And I can tell you what the observations, what the results so far are. And these results are, you know, when you look a little bit from a bird's eye view at the, at the experiments, when you start digging deeper, differences emerge and so on and so forth. But to some extent, there seems to be reasonable fun both functional and anatomical similarity between monkeys and humans in quantity estimation. This is one thing that that's, seems to be more seriously entertained over the past decade or so, and I'll show you a couple of things about it. Um, another thing which I find fascinating is perhaps more recent, maybe somewhat speculative, is the fact that, or the results, that the linguistic encoding of quantity comparison, and we will see that there are actually certain kinds of expressions in, in natural language that do this kind of stuff. They're called quantifiers or comparative <coughs> quantifiers, or, you know, all kinds of expressions of comparison. Uh, it seems that the, these kinds of, uh, uh, the anatomy of the abilities that support this type of expressions or you know the use of these types of expressions seems to be very curiously related to the anatomy of the non-linguistic expressions in monkeys. And the last thing which is very recent, extremely recent, 
is the fact that you can anatomically dissociate, both behaviorally and anatomically, dissociate in humans the linguistic and non-linguistic uh, processes that govern this type of, uh, of uh, um, quantity comparison. So the conclusion will end up being a little bit complex and it will be something of the kind that in fact what you have is that our ability to talk about quantity evolved not so surprisingly for monkey certain uh, arithmetical abilities but the point is that our arithmetical ability lives anatomically at least lives elsewhere and it's to some extent the monkey a non-linguistic ability to deal with, with uh, quantity comparison was taken over by something linguistic. This is the hypothesis I'd like to entertain. Again, the, the empirical support to it is rather weak. I'll concede it immediately. But, you know, if there's anything uh, to be considered, I think this is, this is the direction. And let me tell you a little bit about it. So first of all, it's important to see how one studies compare, you know, numerical comparisons in humans and then we'll move to monkeys. So this is taken from, I think, a landmark experiment by uh, Emanuela Piazza, uh, Stan de Haan, and a whole bunch of them in, in, in near Paris. And the idea here is to habituate you to a particular type of quantity. Here, the quantity is 16. This is the number. So you see um, a, a stream of images, mainly three images, that have the same quantity. In this case, it's 16, as I said. Uh, the, the configuration is different, the luminance is different, but the numerosity is kept constant. You get habituated to it, and then you get number four, which we call the comparandum, or C. And your role is to say whether there are, the fourth set is larger or smaller, it's same or different, and you get a bunch of those things. So every time you get a single one, it can either be relatively distant from your reference uh, stimulus, or it can be the same, in fact, or it can be distant in the other direction. And your job is to say if it's same or different, larger or smaller, and so on and so forth. And the expectation here is, is that Weber's law, which says that the ease and your ability to judge differences between quantities depends not on the difference between them, but rather on the proportion, the expectation is that Weber's law would be, would be uh, uh, abided by. And moreover, that the instructions on performance should be irrelevant to you. Because, you know, you can say that something is bigger or smaller than something else. It's, it's, it's equivalent to saying that the second one is smaller. Okay. There should be no, no impact on how you're instructed. In fact, what these guys usually do is they neutralize the instructions because they use the disjunction. So they say, is it larger or smaller? Is it same or different? And so on and so forth. They ignore the instructions and justifiably so because they're not interested in how you instruct your subjects. And what you find usually is indeed that, namely that your ability to discern something depends on on, on, the, on, on the numerical distance between the two quantities that you need to discern. So if you ask about whether something is same or different here, I think it's percentage of different. This is a behavioral judgment here. It's not actually, it's a mistake. It's not signal intensity. If things are the same, you indicate that they're the same, not different. So you're very low here. If things are very different, you indicate that they're very different. And if there's something in between, you respond that there's something in between. And importantly, and this is in keeping with Weber's law, you end up getting a, the best fitting curve and ends up uh, being symmetrical if you compress the, the the x-axis in this case, if you compress it logarithmically. This is what you get. Um, and again, the results are, as I said, performance is a non-monotone function of the proportion. The best fit is when you, you, know, you compress logarithmically. And there's some other things. But importantly to us, uh, there's no effect of instruction probes on performance. This is the main point here. What you do is when you do the same thing using um, repetition suppression or adaptation in functional MRI, you then look, instead of looking at behavior or reaction time or such measures, you're looking at the degree of suppression of the, of the, MR, of the, 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 the signal, uh, the degree of suppression relative to the degree of similarity between the stimuli, you find the areas in which those uh, uh, Weber functions are, are best represented, you find them bilaterally in the parietal lobes. This is what you find. 
So this is like a basic uh, uh, starting point for us, and this is what I think a landmark <coughs> experiment that was done. Curiously, about the same time that this thing was published, which is 2003, I believe, around the same time, there was a series of articles published by Andreas, Miel and Andreas Nieder from Tübingen and uh, Earl Miller from MIT. They published a series of papers on monkey abilities, except in this case, what they did was they, for, of course, trained the monkeys. Of course, there were no verbal instructions. And what they did is they did electrophysiology and they found something that is strikingly similar to the, to the finding by, by Piazza et al. Here the paradigm is what they call delayed match to numerosity. So what the monkey needs to do is first of all to fixate on something, then see some kind of a numerosity, wait a little bit, and then get one of these two numerosities. If the numerosity, so the monkey is trained, if the numerosity is the same, the monkey lifts, you know, pushes the lever. If it's not, if it's a non-match, as the bottom one here, what the monkey does is waits, and then he gets another one in which there is a match, and then he pushes the lever. So the basic task of the monkey is to do numerical comparison as before, and what the monkey does is uh, gets rewarded for essentially for waiting at the right moments and not waiting at other moments, moments in pushing that lever. And when you read the, physio the neurophysiology, you find in this posterior parietal cortex, which presumably is the, the monkey analog of, of human um, um, uh, parietal, of the relevant hum piece of the human parietal cortex, you find uh, something that, you know, I'm just giving you glimpses of things. Uh, you find high selectivity. So first of all, you find a neuron that fires at a particular uh, part of, of this time course in, in the stimuli as distinct from another. So you do find distinctions of that kind. And secondly, when you look at the, at the uh, spike density here, you, you actually see that there is a preferred numerosity for each of those neurons. Again, it's a matter of degree and how optimistic you are upon reading these and interpreting the statistics. But the basic idea is that you have neurons that specialize in a particular, at least prefer particular kinds of numerosities. To us, the message so far, the very weak message, is that anatomically, upon using these kinds of tasks, you find some similarity between humans and, and, uh, and monkeys. Again, it's not exactly the same task. The reading is not the same. As I said, you look deeper, you start finding differences. But there's something very suggestive about this type of um, anatomical similarity. And people indeed have banked on that and have made rather sweeping claims with respect to the, the perhaps the, the, the um, evolution of, of numerical abilities. This is one example of that. So you can see here monkeys, are, this is taken from a, a review paper by Jamie Cantlon in PNAS a few years ago. So you can see monkeys are fantastically in the uh, parietal lobe. And you can see the same thing in adults. It's basically, it's like summarizing my, my, my presentation so far. And everything supposedly happens around this intraparietal uh, sulcus bilaterally. Okay, well, one thing we did, this is together with Stefan Heim, Katrin Amunds, Dandre, and some others in, in Yulish, we did it in German. And what we were asking here is we were presenting a task that's not so uh, dissimilar from the, the tasks that I described to you, except here the instructions came verbally. And they came in, in in front of each and every one of the stimuli, and they came in a variety. And the variety used expressions of quantity, which we call quantifiers, both, you know, in, in linguistics, in mathematics, in philosophy, expressions of quantity that have very peculiar properties and are an important object of inquiry for the past, yeah, I don't know, since Frege, since the, the, the end of the 19th century or so. And we use two types of quantifiers, which we call here polar opposites. Right now, I'm not defining anything. We use the expressions like many, more than half, few, less than half. This is their German analog, which we use. In German, you say mehr als die Hälfte. This is like the positive more than half. And each, in front of each of the stimuli that we, that in which we parameterized this proportion, in front of, of each of the, stimu of the stimuli, you got a sentence auditorily. More than half of the circles are yellow, or less than half of the circles are blue. And your task was to indicate true or false. So this is, this is what the trial for us looked like. You would hear a sentence of this type with a positive or negative quantifier, and I will elaborate on that later. And then you'd get, a send, a, a, you'd get an image, and your task would be to indicate whether the sentence is true or false. 
namely whether this image makes the sentence true or makes it false. This, this is your task, as you can see here. And importantly, what we end up ended up finding when once we record, sorry, once we recorded, the important thing is, first of all, that the, the stimuli were temporally distinct from one another. So the image started only a little bit after the sentence uh, was done, and that it enabled us to divide the whole event into two pieces. One is the auditory phase, which was non-parametric. It had two types of, or four types of stimuli. And the other one, and, and they, they differed in categorical ways. And the second one is what I call here the parametric phase in which we varied the proportions within the, the, the image itself. So we can actually analyze the, the data according to each of the pieces of the stimulus itself, which is what we did. And I'm showing you just a little bit of that here. Namely, I'm showing you that part that looked at what happened, you know, what areas in your, in your head were active during the time that you saw the visual stimulus, namely the, the image with a different proportion of dots. And what you saw is estimation, which is very much in keeping what other people's have found, what other labs have found, not so surprising because we only added a verbal component at the beginning. You show, we showed that comparison happens exactly what you expect it, where you expect it to happen. I'm, and I'm only looking here at the parietal lobe right now. To this we'll get in a second. I'm only looking at that. And this is pretty much in keeping with the story that's been told previously, namely something of the piazza type that you get the parietal lobe bilaterally. We also got the parietal lobe bilaterally, that monkeys get something that's quite similar to that, and so on. But you see there's a problem here. And there's a serious embarrassment. And the serious embarrassment is that there's a whole bunch of blobs in the frontal lobe. In fact, if you look at this, this is taken from a review paper by Manuela Piazza and Veronique Izar. If you look at this, this, there's a little piece here that happens in the, in, in the very frontal region. Okay? And in fact, if you go back to, the, to this image, if you're really picky, you notice that Jamie Cantlon, in fact, cleansed this image of something. She cleansed this image of a whole, uh, of, of an, uh, well, here you can't see it, but you'll see it later. She cleansed this image of a whole blob of activations in the frontal lobe because she wanted it to look very clear and to drive the point home that there's something happening in the parietal lobe. So let's go back to this embarrassment, namely the, 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 frontal, the frontal activities. And the question is what we do with these uh, especially in light of claims that have been made based on neuropsychology and lesion studies, claims that have been made by Stanislas Dehan and Laurent Cohen and some others regarding the distinctness of language from this numerical system. Their evidence was based on something like a meta-analysis that in fact identified different regions in the parietal lobe, again, uh, around the intraparietal sulcus and something having to do with words something having to do with words. I put these terms in, in, in quotes because I don't understand what they mean. Students started asking me in the past few days, I presented it to Galita Gmon, and she said, what does this thing mean? And I said, I don't really know. So I put it in parentheses because it's really a quote from that review paper that actually had quite an impact. But the point here is that the verbal form of numbers is distinct from the rest of our ability to process numbers. So there's something vague in this respect. With this vague picture, let's just try to move on just a little bit. And I want to move you on to a fascinating, you, you have a Quick question. Attention to number line. Is that in the sense of a, a number line or a line pointing to number? It's actually attention to the number line. OK, so if you, if you need to be clear about uh, to, to use the stress correctly, no, uh, your point is well taken. The number line, that's the point. OK, so, so I'm, I'm moving close to you because I'm deaf. <laughs> so please scream out if you, if you want to ask a question. So here's another experiment, again, a series of very recent experiments, again, coming out of this Nieder lab, which is even more fascinating to me. And what they actually did was they trained monkeys to distinguish between less than and more than. It's unbelievable. And, I, and the big mystery here is, is what exactly they do to the monkeys, how they train them. I know it takes over a year to train a monkey 
in, the, in their lab, but I don't know what they do every day during this year uh, with the monkeys. Uh, but, you know, they, 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 they're quite, something like that, right. But they're quite successful. And here, the paradigm is different from the previous one in two relevant ways. First of all, they don't just use numerosities. They also use continuous lengths. So the task of the monkey here is not just to judge whether one quantity is different from another quantity, but rather discrete quantity, but rather whether this line is longer or shorter than that line. So they, they try to look for generality in the monkey's ability uh, in, in quantity, or is it rather tied to a particular type of stimulus? And the second thing is they train the monkey in two different ways. So if the monkey gets at one point in the sequence, if the monkey gets a red circle, or a red circle with some, something to drink or something like that, the monkey knows that he should judge whether this one is greater than the previous one. And if the monkey gets a blue one, the monkey should judge the opposite. Now whether the monkey interprets one as greater or lesser is not, it, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that the monkey is instructed to realize that this is the opposite in terms of the, of the sequence than the previous one. And then what they look for is they look for neurons which are selective for one or the other instructions. And what they find is they find them in the anterior cortex bilaterally, in, 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 in like prefrontal cortex bilaterally. As far as I know, it's difficult to discern as far as I know, they only find them there. And or, you know, to, in, in, a, in a very, like, the abundance is, is much greater than anywhere else. You can see it's like, a, a, it's, almost, it's, it's almost a quarter. It's almost a quarter of the, of the neurons that they, that they picked on. So are they color selective? I mean, they could be just color selective, and of course color is associated with the rule. But it could be that it's just color selectivity. Whatever it is, they, can, they, they know that they should reverse their relations. Right. That's, that's, all, that's all that is being claimed. They know they should reverse their relations. Okay, that's no small matter. Okay, so again, I, you know, I don't know what drives them. Perhaps it's, you know, co co whatever you call it, but they reverse the relations. I, I think it's amazing. There's like three or four such papers by now. And what they find is that, first of all, you have what they call rule selective neurons, namely those which are, on, which only fire or fire much more when you get the, the less than relation and, or the greater than relation. The quite a few. And when they look at those 68 neurons, they actually find that 23 of them is what they call generalist neurons. And by generalist neurons, what they mean are neurons which fire both with this type of task of discrete numerosity and that, that kind of task of, of continuous numerosity, namely line lengths. So here you can see this is a single neuron, this single neuron is you, you get this like spike density uh, curves for both the line, the line length and the number of dots in both instances. And you can see that the pattern is the same across. So, so we're rec they're recording here during delay number two, namely at the time that you get this instruction of less than and greater than. This is when they record. And you get the difference between less, less than fires much more than, than greater than. And you get the same thing, the same pattern you get when you do it with, uh, with the lines. It's quite amazing to me. Okay. So this is what they find. And again, this is something that they find in prefrontal cortex. So with this in mind, this is the, uh, you know, I've never done anything with monkeys other than look at them, okay? And so, you know, it's not as if I'm an expert on any of this, but at least one thing you we can do is go back to humans and try to connect it to something that humans, that humans do. And here's one thing that you might consider. As you can imagine, this polar opposites business, which I glossed over previously, was not accidentally chosen. It was chosen for a reason. And the reason it was chosen is because there's a formal difference between these two, which I'll show you in a second. I'll, I'll, at least I'll give you a glimpse of it because it's a short talk. But it was chosen for a reason. So there is something intuitive when I tell you that this is positive and this is negative. If I would have told you the opposite, you would have rebelled because it wouldn't have matched your intuitions. But intuitions is something that we need to formalize. 
So just at this point, at least, I can tell you in a whole brain uh, uh, analysis, what were the regions or the, 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 the soul region that in fact activated when you looked at the difference in signal intensity between less than half and few on the one hand and more than half and many on the other. It's the same experiment as before that done in German. What you find is that only in Broca's region do you find a contrast between these two such that the signal intensity for what I call here negative quantifiers exceeds significantly and so on, exceeds the signal intensity um, um, of, the, of those positive quantifiers. And just to make a, sl a small point, and, and, and the regions you can see, again, we haven't done the exact analogies because there are debates between evolutionary anatomists and what exactly this is, but it's not far from suggestive. I'm cheating a little bit because this is bilateral for all we know, and this is only on the left. But let me cheat you at least for the next 10 minutes or so. So this is what, this is what we find, and this is what, uh, what uh, uh, Andreas Nieder and his students found with respect to greater than the, the, the areas of abundance of those neurons that selectively fire for one of the greater than or smaller or lesser than. And let me just teach you the shortest course in semantics that you've ever taken, which is one argument for why we call these guys negative and why they're different. Okay, forget about that. Okay, why they're different. They're different because, or at least one observation about the difference between them has to do with the direction of inferences that they license. So you can see that if I tell you more than, more than half of the students worked hard, you can easily infer that more than half of the students worked. Why? Because if this is the student and this is half the students, and this is the set of students who worked hard, you can tell that it's a subset of the students who worked. So there is a subset relation here, and this is why you infer from this, you, from A, you can infer B. But the curious thing here is that if I tell you the opposite, namely less than half of the students worked hard, the direction of the inference is reversed. Because if this is the students and this is their half, and if less than half of the students worked, then a fortiori less than that worked hard. So the curious thing here, here is that you switch these quantifiers and it, they reverse the direction of the inference. This is important. For one thing that it's important for is that you use it critically in human reasoning. I mean, there's nothing else. What else do you want? You use it in human reasoning. It's quite central to your cognition. And it's a silly little linguistic, inf linguistic difference. In fact, if you look at these sentences, more than half, less than half, they have exactly the same number of syllables. You measure the time it takes. It's exactly the same. Everything is exactly the same. The difference is this one little word, and it affects something that's quite profound about reasoning. It's actually very different when you think about it. The function of these, being relational terms, is very different from the function that is used by people like Dehan when they look at something like verbal form of numbers. So you have to name a number. You do not rely at all when you do this verbal number stuff, you do not rely at all on the compositional properties of those, of those uh, elements which relate propositions, relate words, relate terms, you know, which are, which, which, are, which are formally definable as such. So there's something about this type of contrast. And when you look at this type of contrast in the magnet, bingo, it shows, it shows up in Broca's area can tell you about the anatomy and how you identify it and so on. It's a long story, but we can put it aside now. So this is another piece in this puzzle. So let's see what, we had so, what we've had so far, and then I will conclude. First of all, we've seen evidence for both human and monkey for quantity estimation in the parietal lobe. We've seen evidence for directional, direction selective comparison, namely less than, greater than, in frontal regions in monkeys. And we've seen evidence for linguistic polarity comparisons, more than half, less than half, in left regions, in, in left frontal regions in humans. Of course, one thing that's missing in this, in this plot is what do humans do with non-linguistic non symbols like less than and greater than? 
So this is actually what drove our next experiment, which we, uh, 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 which we did uh, in Montreal and analyzed here. And the idea here was to test humans with non-linguistic instructions and compare the results with what humans do in quantifiers and also what monkeys do with those non-linguistic uh, or the analogs of, of non-linguistic symbols. So this is something that we did uh, partially here and partially at McGill. One of, the, one of my co-authors, maybe the, the one of my co-authors is sitting in the audience, so I'd better be careful. Uh, if I misrepresent him, he gets very angry. Um, and what we did is something that's very similar to the previous patterns. What we did here is we presented sentences exactly as before. Subjects saw different types of stimuli where the proportion was varied. The proportion between the reference and the comparandum was varied. We saw, we, we saw this and the, the, the subjects had to indicate true or false as before. And we had, this is what the sentences looked like. The quantifier more and less, they really take exactly the same duration. These are the sound files that you can see. We presented the picture afterwards, and then there's a reaction time phase. And we had seven different types of, uh, of proportion images that were controlled in various and sundry ways. And then we did exactly the same thing, except here we gave nonverbal instructions. So the, patient, the subjects were instructed uh, visually to look at these stimuli and then indicate which, is, which one exceeds what. And in order to make sure that they read from left to right, we actually presented these kinds of, direct, of instructions uh, uh, incrementally. They first saw one piece, then they saw two pieces, and then three, so as to force them to read from left to right, something we only realized later. And we expected to find exactly the same thing, okay? So supposedly, we know already that those negative quantifiers tax your broker's region a little more. Maybe they would take a little, a little longer when, 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 you, when you try to respond, uh, just when you measure reaction times. And indeed, you know, not surprisingly, what we found are those Weber functions. Uh, this is logarithmically compressed. We found those Weber functions for more than half and for less than half. We found that the baseline goes up quite significantly when you process less than half. It's a little bit more difficult. Uh, uh, the, we, f we also showed that uh, uh, those lines actually are parallel, so it's only baseline. You don't, you know, it doesn't affect uh, it doesn't affect your sigma or anything like that, or hardly affects affects that. So the the two processes are in fact uh, independent of one another, namely the linguistic analysis and the image and, and the proportion analysis. We find these, and so far this is like no reason to, for to celebrate. No big surprise. It's exactly what you would expect. But here's the surprise. The surprise was that when you presented these kinds of, of uh, stimuli, there was just like no difference in reaction times. The, the functions were sitting right on top of one another. Nothing. And of course, you know, we found that there's very strong interaction of instruction type by polarity. So, you know, you were very sensitive to those negative quantifiers in terms of your reaction time, but not at all in terms of your, uh, of your uh, 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 non-linguistic instructions. They really dissociated. We then tested aphasics. This is a project that uh, we did in Argentina. We tested aphasics there. And again, here, the, the dependent variable was just proportion correct. They got many, many stimuli, many sentences, many images with all these proportions. And when they looked at the positive quantifiers, like many and more than half, OK, uh, it's like mas de la mitad, I think. And this is muchas. And when you do that, you find that the proportion correct each of these lines is, a, is an individual patient. There are many trials. And each of these lines is an individual patient. You find that you know, they're very close to 100% correct, or they're reasonably close to 100% correct when the numerosities are distinct from one another. And like everybody else, they drop to somewhere that's really low when, this, when there's too much of similarity between those, between those, uh, those numerosities. But curiously, so you can see across these two quantifiers, they're very well behaved. But when you give them those negative quantifiers, they collapse completely. They really collapse. And this is what you would expect for, you know, again, if you get lesions to be so cutely uh, de de delineated as, as in this patient, it's exactly what you'd expect if Broca's region is involved in, in the calculation of those negative quantifiers. You wouldn't expect much, anything that's much different. And the, oops, what have I done? Okay, oh, I see, it's just died because it's, okay. The remarkable thing here is what happens when you test the same patients on those symbols, 
those arithmetic algebraic symbols. And what you find when you test them on these symbols is that once again, regardless of the direction of this inequality, the performance goes up. It's a highly, highly selective deficit in this type of semantic ability. Namely, it's only in those negative polarity, in, in those uh, 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 quantifiers that are, that whose polarity is negative that they actually drop. And I just want to show you, uh, these patients have lesions which are described quantitatively with technologies that, it was de that were developed in the Eulish Anatomy Project. Um, I just want you, I hope this will work, and I want you to see, this was the first patient we tested, the, the quality of this is not great, but you get the idea very, very quickly if everything works. Okay, let's see. Okay, no problem at all. You don't need to speak Spanish in order to understand that she says uh, many of the circles are blue. You can see what, uh, what's, what's visible there. And the patient was very quick in saying C. Now she's presented with pocos. This is few. Okay. She's asking for more. So I guess if there's one thing you'll remember from this talk, it's this. Okay, I think she got it right actually in the end. And this was her lesion. It's a clinical scan. It's not much to be done with, but it gives you at least some idea. Finally, we recently did the same thing in FRI. Uh, again, with uh, Galit Agmon, Isabel uh, Deschamps, Jonathan Levinstein too. And we did exactly the same thing in the magnet. And we wanted to see what we get when we distinguish between those symbols and those linguistic symbols. So what we're looking for here is those regions in the brain which don't just give you a difference between the negative quantifier and the, op and the positive quantifier, but actually give you an interaction between this effect, this main effect, and this main effect. So I'm showing you just one slide. It's something I, I got actually two weeks ago or a week ago. Just one slide that looks for the interaction when you record from this part of the, of the stimulus. It gets much more interesting later, but never mind. And uh, yeah, and we did the same thing here. I'm just looking at this composition phase in the brain to see and those areas in the brain which give you an interaction between this and this. And here's where you find them. Okay, you find two blobs, one which is pretty big. This is all corrected. Um, it's pretty big in the left in front of, uh, uh, inferior frontal gyrus. You also find something in the superior temporal gyrus. I don't want to tell you a long story about it, but it, we can put it aside. It makes the story, of course, more complicated. But at least there's one thing that you find, exactly the interaction that you expect. So you get this from three convergent uh, directions that, in fact, this is something that is modulated by quantifier complexity of some sort to be specified, but not by those symbols in humans. And curiously, the kind of analog to what, what is happening in the symbols, the analog in the monkey, you do find in a, in, a, in, in, a, in a closely related region. This is the puzzle here. So let me just summarize this. What we find is that both monkeys and humans abide by Weber's law. We find that they rely on parietal circuits for numerical comparisons. Same thing for humans and, and monkeys. We also find that they rely on prefrontal circuits for more complex relations. This is the monkeys. Of course, it's not symbolized in their mind like that, but they do understand reversal of orders in, in, in the calculation of qu in quantity comparison. This is the crucial thing. And what we do find is that in humans, they rely on these front prefrontal circuits in the processes of quant quantifier polarity, but not for the complex relations. This is the puzzle here. And what I want to suggest, which, is, which seems crazy to me as well, is that in fact, you know, first of all, it's, you know, it's really not earth shattering to say that human ability to talk about quantity evolved from monkey arithmetical ability. This is not uh, 
something that would surprise anyone. But the interesting thing is that it might be that the frontal mechanism for, ar for arithmetic in the monkey were actually taken over by related uh, linguistic functions of, of, uh, of uh, processing quantification in terms. They were taken over, and in humans, and this is why in humans, they're actually, those relations are processed elsewhere. Where exactly, I don't know. And before ending, I just want to thank all my, all my collaborators everywhere, at McGill, in Eulish, at the University of Buenos Aires, and of course, of course here, okay, and all these uh, funding agencies. Thank you. Once language what? Once language appeared, emerged. One, lang Once language emerged, and it has emerged, people argue, for many, many different reasons. Arithmetic reasoning may be one of them. But I think it is uh, the fact that other uh, animals uh, uh, communicate is not an argument uh, against saying that the communication was important in the evolution of language. Uh, other animals also have uh, episodic like memory. Nevertheless, episodic memory in humans is related to language. So the question is, uh, once language appeared for whatever reasons, and it may have been many reasons, and the reason that, the, and the reason that you have suggested, I think, makes sense, among others, then obviously there would be, uh, there would be a, that we will see that the networks of language in humans are, uh, are associated with several networks of different cognitive abilities in monkeys. This is what we expect, but I think that to derive from this the conclusion that this is a direct kind of a derivation, evolutionary derivation, I think this is taking it too far. Oh, it's taking it extremely far, but I got to tell you something. I never speak about the, div the, the evolution of language. This is to me, again, I can only say things which I have data for. And to me, talking about <coughs> language is, is, a, is, is, never a pos is not even a remote possibility. Because to me, language breaks down into very small pieces of knowledge, of processes that are related to it, and so on. Syntax, semantics, whatever. This is, uh, you know, how people like me spend their lives, uh, what people like me spend their lives doing. So the claims that I, I have made here has not, is not about language at all. And this, the, the, the internal logic of it has to do with, an, it's based on anatomical proximity of, of, and functional proximity. That's the basic idea. So let's just put things in perspective. I'm making no claims about language with a capital L, or not even with a small L, okay? I'm just saying one thing, that if you look at, if, if anatomical proximity is ever to be an argument, and I think to an extent it should be an argument, if anatomical proximity is ever to be an argument, there's a very curious proximity of a, of a well-described relation. And I didn't delve into the formal properties of quantifiers and, and tried to reflect on the difference between this relation that's called greater of an inequality as, a, as some kind of an algebraic relation and, the, and, the, and the, the formal properties of quantifiers. I said nothing about it, okay? But the important thing is to stick to the empirical record as much as you can. And here, the empirical record is quite striking. Now, whether or not you can end up making, making the speculation, and I, I, I sort of, I think it was clear how hedging I am by calling it a vast speculation and by apologizing 5,000 times for even delving into this highly speculative area. This is not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to actually make this as a, one second, one second, Chava. One second, Chava. <laughs> Chava, one second. I'm, I'm trying to be extremely cautious about these things because I don't like speculation. Okay, and the only thing that you have here is anatomical proximity. If you, if you don't want to make anything of it, you might be missing a generalization. If you want to be ma making something of it, you have to go and, and do a further study of the nitty gritty <coughs> details of it. But it's not about language, it's about one tiny aspect of language which happens to be quite profound, namely quantification. Yeah, much simpler question. Um, <coughs> you said we the first few slides that instruction did not, did not affect processing time. 
Did you mean instructions in the sense of verbal or in linguistic instructions versus algebraic? No, no. What I, uh, no. The, what they did, this is in the Piazza mm -hmm. uh, paper. So first of all, to be fair to them, they never reported any instructional uh, difference. It's not rep they don't talk about it because they, they're not interested in that. They're fantastic experimenters, but they don't talk about it. But what they did is very different. They gave the instructions to their subjects before the experiment, before the subjects went into the magnet, thinking naively, in my view, that if you give the instructions five years earlier, it's not as if you entertain them. In, it's, you, have to, you can forget about entertaining them in your mind in each, in each and every trial. Of course you do. But perhaps it weakens the signal. That's one thing. And secondly, as I also pointed out, they and some others, like Hilary Barth and Nancy Kenwisher and somebody else I don't remember, uh, did this kind of thing uh, uh, a little later. They tried to counterbalance the instructions exactly for their linguistic content. So they do use it. They did it with the use of, in, of a disjunction. They said or. So greater or smaller, you know, bigger or less, you know, greater or lesser, bigger or smaller, more or less. You know, they, they do it. They, they give it. They give you the option basically. How that affects your signal, I don't know. But again, no such, uh, and this is the reasonable thing to do from their perspective. They're only interested in numerical comparison. So they sort of shied away from this whole thing. And what, what, what we are doing here is we're getting exactly to that part and trying to break it down into its component parts and understand something. So, you know, this is as much as I can and say. Their instructions are constant. That they don't change from trial to trial. Therefore, you can tell it once and usually. We, modu you, right. we modulate it. We modulate the instructions. Exactly. That's the point. We modulate the instructions. Yes, please. Uh, question and comment. If I understood you correctly, people are generally better at greater than than less than? Uh, I don't know about greater than, but I know about more than, more than. and less than. More yeah, than and, there, there, and there are differences. Okay, but um, I wonder, based on my own self, whether or not there are differences between uh, people at, in different domains of profession and education. Because those of us that grew up with number line have a strong thinking that in our heads, our image is fewer is on the left, more is on the right, less than uh, on the left is much, much easier professionally in writing programs. We avoid greater than. And well, if anything, okay, so if anything, it would work the opposite, because here it turns out that um, the, the, the less than or fewer than, depending on few, always activates you more and takes you longer. So it's the opposite from what you'd I'm expect. That, and the, that people like me would have maybe we should put you. Segment Exact Maybe we should put you. This was very interesting to see if there are individual differences, like you know, like uh, some kind of multimodal distribution of the population in the quantificational uh, realm. It might be. It might be the case. I don't know. We haven't. Uh, we haven't. I, I, we haven't looked at it, and I don't know that anyone else. But I should just say one thing: why I insisted that greater than is not more than. The reason is that great, greater is an adjective and more is a quantifier and great, great is an adjective. And it actually turns out there's, there's now a series of studies by Galita Gmon, jointly supervised by Jonathan and myself. There's a series of studies that, that actually finds differences, again, an interaction between uh, polar, polar opposites in quantification and antonyms. So one thing she did, again, right so far in reaction time, but we're putting into the magnet, is to look, just as we looked at more and less on the one hand and the, those inequality signs, her control was greater than and, and uh, larger and smaller. Okay? And at least behaviorally, she finds an interaction. Namely, the contrast between large and small is much lesser than the contrast between more and less, which is what we expect if we think that there's something special about quantifiers. Okay, one last question, yes. Just a related question. Um, on, in the experiments uh, using the quantifiers, you know, with either, with either uh, monkeys or humans, was there a gender difference in the performance? I have no idea, okay. I have no idea. Uh, these are good points, but uh, you know, all of these are very good points. You know, it's not as if we, we, we have done anything like that so far. In Germany, I have very little control over the over who who are the subjects, 
They're basically their staff of Yulish, the Yulish Research Center. So they, whoever comes in gets tested, but it's, it's something that needs to be tested, no question. So when Udi asked me to, to speak here at, uh, about evolution, I, uh, my, my ini initial response was, of course, I have nothing to say about evolution. And uh, then I told him, okay, what I have to say about evolution is really so basic that uh, it, it's so far remote from anything we had so far. Although after seeing the program, I thought we maybe could say something about some speculative ideas about language. But actually, I want to share with you some other speculations, which I think are quite fascinating. And uh, since this is a general audience, I cannot assume much about the background in uh, physics or thermodynamics. But this is really a, a fasc fascinating topic that I want some of you at least to appreciate. So this talk, uh, I promise you, will have something mysterious and, and un misunderstood or ununderstood for everyone here, including the experts. And those of you who don't know anything about uh, the title even, I mean, what, the, what do I mean by the thermodynamics of information, um, you should at least understand the notion of onset of life. So I'm really trying to address a question which until very recently was not considered part of science at all, which is uh, the very beginning of life. And, and can we actually say something quantitative about uh, the onset of evolution? I mean, the, the starting point of everything. And uh, surprisingly, I mean, the story goes back quite some uh, time ago. I mean, actually 200 years ago almost. Uh, as, as some of you should know, I mean, uh, a branch of science called thermodynamics was established. <laughs> and uh, thermodynamics uh, had in it uh, a certain mysterious aspects. I mean, it was developed more or less as an engineering question. I mean, how to build uh, efficient heat engines or, or steam engines. <laughs> and and what, what are really the governing laws that control the ability to transfer heat into work? And Eventually, it hit on some very fundamental questions, especially in uh, what is known as the second law of thermodynamics, I mean, the, which I'll iterate in a second, uh, which is, <laughs> turned out to be not only one of the most fundamental uh, laws of nature, which we cannot avoid, actually survived uh, almost intact the, the, the big revolutions of the 20th century uh, in physics. Uh, it's also... Uh, one of the most mysterious uh, laws of, of nature, in the sense that there are still debates about the meaning of it, and especially the connections between uh, the second law of thermodynamics, the, this uh, s tendency of systems to move from more ordered to less ordered states, in some very general sense, if they are isolated. And so the connection between the thermodynamic, the, this second law of thermodynamics, and both the notion of information, <coughs> and today also computation, is a very mysterious and still very controversial issue. And the other, of course, which has been all along there, is the connection between this law, the, the tendency of isolated systems to move from le less, ordered to, uh, less disordered to more disordered states. What is the connection between this and life? And how can we explain the emergence of life or such, uh, with the, or reconcile the, the phenomena of life with, with such a tendency to get more disordered. So this has been around for a very long time. And as I said, for, for, to a large extent, what I'm going to say today is some sort of a, a review of a, what I call, consider very fascinating a part of the history of science, which goes again all the way from the 1820s till very recently. And it's still very much alive and very much relevant to the questions of this uh, symposium. And it turns out it's actually related to things that I've been thinking about in a very, in somewhat surprising way. And that's how I connect it to this, the onset of evolution and, and the understanding of cognition in general. So essentially, the first part of my talk, which is probably the only thing I will be able to, to describe here, is what I call the connection between information and life. And uh, actually, I want to talk about a, really what we call a rudimentary uh, you know, physicist have two very interesting uh, tools. One of them is called thought experiments, or the Duncan experiments. So essentially, derive results without any experiment, just thinking about it. And it's amazing how much, how many deep insights about the, the world and nature were gained actually by thought experiments. 
And some of them are, are mentioned here, especially a, a construct uh, designed already by, by, by James Clark Maxwell, one of the, the greatest physicists ever, uh, who is responsible also for the uh, theory of electromagnetism and many other things. Uh, in, in 1871, actually, he proposed a design, a, 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 something which later on was called Maxwell's Demon by Lord Kelvin, actually, but he actually thought about uh, an intelligent being that is able to make microscopic observations, and I'll tell you more about it in a second. And then later on, this, this demon, there were just many, many attempts to exercise this, uh, actually led to uh, this, this uh, new controversial science, if you want, that is not known today as the thermodynamics inf of information, or really what are the fundamental limits on the ability to compute things, memorize things, erase memory, and so on and so forth. And at the same time, and this is a, more my part of the story, I believe it also clarified for the first time ever, or at least gave, gave us some very strong clues about the nature of two fundamental concepts, what, what is information and what is life. Okay, so that sounds very promising, I hope. Uh, so from that, I, I will uh, really try to connect this uh, understanding of Maxwell's demon through, through a construct that was designed by Zillard, Leo Zillard in, in the 20s of the past century, around 1926, 7, and 9, in three different papers, uh, which is now known as Zilla, Zilla's information engine. I'll describe this in, in great detail. And, and later on, much later, in the 60s of the previous century, uh, this was reconnected with another notion, which is now known as Landauer principle, uh, uh, with the ability not only to make measurements, but also to forget or er erase memory. Is there water here? Yeah. Okay. It's very hot. I don't know if, you, if there is an air conditioner here, it should be turned on. So, uh, so this is, uh, these three aspects of uh, the demon uh, I, I actually take very seriously and, and will try to connect it with other aspects of information and then connect it with what I call sensing acting systems, which in other words are intelligent or living systems. And uh, maybe the, the last, last very little, very short part of my talk is, is really try to show you that taking this seriously in some sense and putting it in some concrete setting and concrete mathematics, we can actually maybe able to say something about what's driving evolution. I mean, not only how life emerge, but how they get more and more complicated. Okay, so I know this is extremely, not only speculative, but uh, ambitious and pretentious and whatever you want. It's all, I deserve all of that. But this is supposed to be a controversial, uh, you know, <laughs> intriguing type of uh, symposium. So what is life? So I know sitting in a life science institute, uh, the first thing that you hear about life is, is this uh, definition, essentially. Those are systems that have metabolic exchange of matter and energy with the environment. Okay, so they're never closed. They have some sort of interaction with them. Then if they're isolated, if I isolate a living organism in, in the thermodynamic sense, I put it in a box with no interaction with anything else, it will die. This is quite clear. It, it will, and in that sense, it, it doesn't violate the, the second law of thermodynamics because it's in isolation, it's, it's going to move to disorder, or to, 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 to less ordered state. But there are many, many other things that have metabolic exchange of energy and matter. And in some sense, this is a, 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 a it's, it's not a very useful definition. I mean, at least as far as I'm concerned, it's certainly not unique to life. And it's not something we can easily quantify. I mean, we can quantify it, but it's, it's a complicated quantification because I had I to take into account all these, these different interactions, <laughs> whether it is a photosynthesis like in this picture, or it is a, any other exchange of matter and energy with the environment. So this is a, obviously true for living organisms, but not uniquely true for living organisms. The other property that is really considered important for life is, is what we call self-replication or the ability to reproduce. Okay, these are the two things that I would, when I was, I heard about the first time in my life about the definition of life, that's more or less in, I don't know, eighth grade or seventh grade, something like this. Uh, our, our teacher, which I still remember very well, told me this is life. I mean, system that have metabolism and exchange uh, matter with the environment and self-reproduct. 
None of them, I remember even then, <laughs> I was unhappy with this definition. Because first of all, it's really not fundamental, it's not unique. I mean, you can think about crystals in, 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 in some sort of uh, uh, liquid uh, with molecules in it, uh, which exchange, replicate, grow, do everything that you want. And, and, and uh, actually self-replication, as, as seen in this, in this slide, was recently done with very, very simple things of sphere of clusters of, of some sort of nanotechnology. Uh, so self-replication is not unique to life. And it's not enough to really, uh, for any satisfactory definition of life. There's another thing which is usually associated with life. This is what maybe some of you heard about. It's, it's known as dissipation-driven adaptation. I mean, this is, this is the kind of thing that is responsible for the pattern formation of very, very complex things in, in nature, like snowflakes, for example. So it's some sort of competition between two opposing sources, which one of them is tending to order things and the other one is tending to disorder things, like everything around us. I mean, it's some sort of competition like this. And the minimum energy and maximum entropy of things like this. And in, in, indeed, under some conditions, such dissipation driven adaptation can lead to very fascinating formations, including things that we may want to call living things. And actually, there's been a lot of very interesting developments in the understanding of such system in, in, in what we call non-equilibrium thermodynamics. Really recently, I mean, in the last 20 years, uh, with some breakthroughs that really, I believe, uh, also related to the question of really how life emerged. Especially, I would like to mention the, the work of Zorzinski on, on the redefinition of the notion of equilibrium states, which really removed a lot of the confusion that people had about thermodynamics equilibrium. And also, maybe you heard about the work of Jeremy, Jeremy England and others who are actually using this type of ideas to generate self-replicating uh, living-like systems. But there's another aspect of life which I consider most important. And this is the ability of life to behave in a way which looks at least on short time scales, non-causal. Non they behave as if they have some knowledge about the future, and in order to understand how they behave, I really need to, I cannot take just the initial conditions, the past of the system, I need to see, there's something they know, I mean, flowers know that the spring is coming, and the bees are going to come, and they have all sorts of knowledge, or something that seems like knowledge, about things that are not, haven't been yet there. So this is something which I, I, thought, I think is, is quite fundamental to life. The ability to make short and, and longer term, term predictions of the future and actually use it in a way which looks as if there is a causal or some tel teleological, some, 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 some uh, reason for their, for their behavior is something quite interesting. And then I think about this, this particular definition of life, so my definition of life, systems that exploit the predictability or the predictable fluctuations of their environment for survival. This is something which looks very odd at first as a definition of life, but it's something which we can take very, very seriously and very concretely, mathematically, and actually try to make sense of it. Now, okay, so you don't have to believe me that this is, li this is life. This is my definition of life. I, I, I argue that it, it, it is true for anything that you call a life from, from a virus to to a supercomputer or whatever, and uh, it, they all have this tendency to uh, exploit fluctuations for benefit. Now, okay, so I want to take it seriously, and, and for that I, I want to go back to what I said before, Maxwell's demon. Okay, so Maxwell, as I said, I mean, was, uh, is no exaggeration, one of the hand top uh, best scientists ever, but uh, uh, at the end of the, the middle of the, of, the, of the 19th century, around 1870, he wrote a fascinating book called The Theory of Heat. Uh, and in this book, he introduced, he was trying to challenge the second law of thermodynamics, and let me just read, say it more carefully in this case. Uh, if, so if there is a, a system like a, a gas in a box, it will always eventually move on some sort of average long term into state which is more disordered than the initial condition. We always move from disordered state, to, from ordered state to disordered state, and, some, and the tendency of this to, to increase disorder is known as the second law of thermodynamics, and there are many, many different formulations of it. One of them is through this mysterious notion known ent as entropy, which is essentially measuring the order of the system or the uncertainty we have about the system, 
And this entropy should increase with time. This is one in an isolated system. So what Marshall said, you can take a gas and put it in a box and essentially divide it into two, so such that originally it's some sort of equilibrium, so the molecules on the two sides of the box have the same average velocity. We now know that this notion of entropy, and Maxwell, of course, was one of the originators of this theory, uh, the kinetic theory of gases, is actually uh, uh, this entropy is due to the random fluctuation of the motion of the molecules in the gas. And essentially, what the second law is telling us is that you cannot take a uniform uh, temperature, I mean, a system in equilibrium, and spontaneously turn it into a non-equilibrium system, which means, let's say, hot temperature on the left and, and, and cold temperature or cold molecules in terms of lower kinetic energy on the right. But what he said, okay, if I had a demon, <laughs> he didn't call it demon, demon, he called it an intelligent being, something that could essentially observe the molecules and open the door between those two cells when there is a fast molecule coming from the right or slow molecule coming from the left. And then by essentially manipulating this, this door, and of course it sounds very funny, I mean, what, what do you mean by this? <laughs> And so, of course, the whole thing was analyzed very, very carefully many, many times already. But essentially, by manipulating this door, this intelligent being could uh, uh, violate the second law by turning the hot molecules on one side and the cold molecules on the other side and generate a temperature difference. And this was a no-no for the physicists of the 19th century. Okay, so there was infinite amount of literature since then <laughs> on what is the, the, the meaning of, what, what's wrong with this construction? Essentially what some people call exercising the Maxwell's demon. And uh, I don't want to get into it because I think this is not the point. Obviously the second law of thermodynamics, or not obviously, but it's not violated in the way it is formulated. If you take the whole system, including the demon, and look at the whole thing, the entropy or the disorder should increase. But the interesting and what I think was was completely ignored for many, many years, is that this, again, thought experiment, Gedanken experiment, actually tells us something very fundamental about what we now call information and what we call intelligence. I mean, this, you know, uh, somehow, somehow, somehow uh, joke-like manner that Maxwell said intelligent being is actually the beginning, I believe, of what we now call the theory of intelligent, natural, or artificial, whatever. And, uh, what is again, not, not most people don't dare to say it, uh, it's telling us something about the beginning of what we now call life. Now, to make a, a long story short, in 1929, Zillard, Leo Zillard, took Maxwell Damon very seriously, and in a paper, which is also controversial by the way until today, uh, he, he, uh, he suggested the following, what he called engine, how to really turn uh, information into energy or into work, uh, in this case, not just energy, yeah, imagine that you actually have this, this uh, demon, and this demon is able to look at a, a box of gas, this cylinder, which essentially has only one molecule in it, but it's in contact with what we call heat bus, which means it, is, it has an average kinetic energy which is fixed and determined by the temperature of the bus. Again, if you don't understand what I'm saying, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to teach thermodynamics more than this. So, uh, what this demon was supposed to do is to insert some sort of a barrier, or essentially massless barrier, very, very, very light, and you could do it carefully enough where the molecule was far enough from the barrier, almost, or essentially there's no loss of energy, insert this barrier, and then observe if the molecule is on the left side or the right side of the barrier. And then, if it is on the left side, it will hang uh, some sort of a weight, a mass on the left side, and if it's on the right side, it will hang the same mass on the, on the, on the left side, or right, the left, whatever, the same side that you observe. And then, these uh, spontaneous kicks that the molecule is going to give to the barrier is going to lift the mass, well, in, some, in some sense, a little bit. And, and this is essentially in, vi in co complete violation to the second law of thermodynamics, so on average, this mass should fluctuate, but not really uh, grow, but if I have information, I know where the particle is, I can actually turn it into a continuous increase of life, of, 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 uh, of mass, or continuous work, and eventually generate energy or generate work. 
So this was eventually turned into what is now known as Zillow's cycle, which is very, very related. But actually, those of you who know something about thermodynamics, it's not the Carnot cycle, because the Carnot cycle always works in two different temperatures. This is a cycle that really turns information into value, into energy, in a single temperature. It's one heat bath, which is supposed to, what's really happening here? So as I, as I said, I must say that there are still people who think that the whole thing is, is wrong. But, but the analysis now most common is actually there is in this nice cycle, you have the preparation, the heat path and the barrier, then you have the measurement, you measure, you get information about the location of the molecule, and then you do an action, which is essentially hang the mass on one of the sides, depending on your measurement, and then the fluctuations of the environment, which is just random, will essentially push, give you energy, give you value in my, in my language. And in other words, what this demon is doing is by measurements, by sensing the environment, is actually turning this into, into value by essentially distinguishing between positive and negative fluctuations of the environment. And that's, this was, as I said, another Gedanken experiment, another experiment which was never implemented in practice. But if you look at the ingredients of it, Again, you have randomness in the environment, which is due to the heat bath. This environment is turned into a mechanical work, which in general we like to call the value. And it's doing it by using sensing information, some sort of measurement, and turning it into control or actions by hanging the mass on the right side. This is beautiful because it's essentially the simplest possible, almost the simplest possible imaginable system that works against the law of thermodynamics but looks like something which has sensing, acting, and memory. There's something very important there. In this, uh, in this demon's head, there's one bit of memory where he saw the, he has to remember the results of his measurement and actually use it in a valuable way in order to hang the mask correctly. And this memory turns out to be very important. So essentially, Zillard already, although not in this language, uh, achieved this uh, bound by an analyzing this system that uh, total amount of work that you can extract per cycle of this engine is bounded by KT, or the temperature of the system, multiplied by a quantity. He then said log, log two. This was the number he gave because this was a perfect measurement. But if I have an imperfect measurement, let's say I have mistakes, either in my measurement or in my action, then it is bounded by something we call the mutual information between your output and between your observation and, and the state of the system. This is beautiful, why it's beautiful. First of all, of course, we didn't know anything about information at that time. This was 20 years before Shannon, before Shannon's paper on information. But it's already giving you a very concrete link between a physical quantity, work, energy in this case, and this eluding thing which we call information, which people thought uh, you know, is the matter of uh, the mind or the, of the thought. It has nothing physical in it. And essentially, you see, and actually, Shannon gave Again, very uh, many others relations of that nature, that our physical quantity is related to informational quantities of that sort, which are some sort of pr properties of the distribution of things in, in the system. And this was, to, in my opinion, the beginning of information theory as we can know it today. And the, the whole thing uh, can be generalized to, to quantum system. Let me just skip it. What is really interesting that in the last 10 years, system like this were actually built. I mean, actually, there was a lot of, energy, a lot of discussion over 50 years since Zillard about whether the whole thing is real or just uh, imaginary, this whole thing can be done. And in the past 10 years, using all sorts of nanotechnology things, people build the Zillard engine with uh, one caveat, and that the, 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 the demon was, of course, not part of the system. I mean, this was, which was some sort of a, a, a computer outside, but you can do it with an electron in what we call single electron box with a single electron transistor and essentially turn the whole thing to be electric. And actually people measured it. Or you can do photo, uh, all sorts of uh, nanotechnology, it doesn't matter, with the dimers, with particles. What is really interesting is that what they found is that there is some connection between the amount of work you can extract from this and something else which was later on known as uh, the cost of erasing information, or, or Landauer principle. So uh, let me go through it rather quickly, uh, because this is somewhat tricky. But essentially, if you look at, as again, Zillow's engine, I mean, the connection between these, where you put uh, the particle or where you identify the particle, left or right of the box, 
if you think about memory, memory is a system in, in a very fundamental sense that has two possible states, or let's say a particle in a, in a well potential in two states, where you identify, let's say, one state with zero and the other state with one. And in order to erase memory, and that's what Landauer argued, uh, you must uh, generate heat. And again, the argument is so tricky that I wanted to go, don't have time and don't want to get into it because it's still, as I said, uh, debatable. And you can still find papers that argue against it. But this was really the beginning of what people call the thermodynamics of information processing or the thermodynamics of computation, which eventually led to a much more general question, how much heat a computer must generate, which is actually a very important practical question today. And you, you see that Google actually has to put the, the servers in the Columbia River in order to cool them. And actually, it's, going, it's affecting the weather in the northern United States today. <laughs> you understand that the heat generated by computers is actually quite important, <laughs> at least today. And the question is, how much of it is essential and how much of it can be avoided? And what Landauer and many others, Bennett and a long number of people after him, essentially argued that as long as you do the computation in a reversible way, which means Adiabatically, you don't erase anything, then you, you can essentially do it with as little heat or, or work generated as you want. But once you want to erase bits, then you pay with energy or with entropy. OK, so this was uh, another part of the story of, uh, of the Maxwell demon because th so that the standard explanation of why the Maxwell demon doesn't work is because the erasure of the memory of the demon Every cycle, you need to reset the memory because you need to restart the whole thing. Uh, is going to give you, to cost you at least as much uh, uh, energy or entropy as the one that you got from the motion. So overall, the total, the total thing is going to grow, the total entropy. Now, OK, so this was very long. But so it turns out that the story, and this is again through some very interesting developments, recent developments, again, last 20 years, uh, in, the, in the theory of non-equilibrium thermodynamics, as I, as I said, I mean, Zazinski is one of the most important there, but there are many, many others uh, that relate this, essentially asking what happens if you take a system out of equilibrium, what is the maximum amount of work that you can generate, and how to define something which we usually, in the classical thermodynamics, we only could define for equ equilibrium state, called the free energy of the state. Uh, it can be generalized very, very nicely and very intuitively to systems outside of equilibrium, in any arbitrary far from equilibrium, not just close to equilibrium. Uh, and this was quite remarkable because actually very simple, it's a very simple, a very simple construction. And they proved actually that, that there is a lower bound given by this particular construction uh, as you adiabatically move the system back to some other equilibrium state, uh, which is giving you a bound of how much you can extract by perturbing a system outside of equilibrium. And using this formulation, you can actually analyze this construct of, of Zillard, I mean, how much uh, you can actually gain in terms of work by essentially pushing the system outside of equilibrium and then let the fluctuations expand again. And this is precisely this type of, of story. And what is nice about it is that you find that there are actually two terms. One of them is the measurement work. This is what you can gain by using the information of the measurement. And the other one is the erasure reset work. And both of them must increase it must be bounded below by the information. Essentially, this, this is a way of keeping the, 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 the law, second law of thermodynamics alive. OK, how is this related to life? I mean, I don't know how much time I have. 10 minutes? Something like that. <laughs> OK, so it turns out that completely independently, some of us, including me in the, in the, in the last 10 years, thought about an entirely different question, which is, uh, what is, how can I describe organisms, living things, by this type of interaction with the environment? I mean, so what is the minimal information required for useful behavior in a very general setting? And actually, when you look at this picture, which I took from a, a review paper, a nature paper in, 19, in February 2015, uh, of Sagawa and, and some others, what they have there is the memory of the organism, X is the environment, and the measurement and the memory, the environment and memory have some sort of interaction through measurements and then through what he calls feedback, which is essentially the reaction of the environment to the action. And then he said, okay, here you can get gain work, and here you must lose work by resetting your memory. And the point is that you can be useful in that sense only if, you, if your gain work is better than, is more than the erase work, at least 
from the point of view of the organism. Now we looked at systems like this. Okay, our brain. Okay. Well, when I think about a very simple brain now. One bit of brain, one bit of sensing, and one bit of actions. Okay, this I believe is the simplest possible organism. <laughs> Essentially, this is Zilla's brain, or Zilla's engine. But, uh, so, but, but in general, what the brain is doing is some sort of an interaction with the world. I mean, so we have perception, sensory information coming instantaneously at every time through our senses. What is really important about it are only, only two numbers. One of them is how much it costs you in terms of metabolism. I mean, uh, energy, whatever, molecules of materials, computation maybe. But the other thing is how much information was actually transferred from the world to you through this channel of perception. And the other thing is action or behavior. How much, how, how are we affecting the world? Actually, how are we interacting with the world in, in, in terms of information again? And in many cases, actually, we are passive in the sense that we don't really affect the world, but our brain is rewarding us. Like, for example, when you listen to music, uh, by some sort of uh, reward that is, has to do with the ability to make good predictions on what's happening. So what is nice about this uh, story, the perception action cycle, that in a sense, it's a direct generalization of Zillard's Maxwell demon with Landauer, with the loss of information. And that's something I realized only recently. So essentially, of course, when we talk about, uh, about sensing acting systems, we usually we are not living in a cycle which is completely identical. I mean, we have memory, long-term memory. I mean, we remember things from the previous cycle and so on. Our memory is, is much more complicated than that. So in, in, in general, sensing acting systems like this have some sort of compression, some sort of memory from the past, and actually are planning into some sort of future window into the future. And of course, the whole thing becomes much more complicated because now we have to think about not just the last measurement, but uh, the last sequence of measurements, and not just the next action, but the, the next sequence of action, or the plan. And essentially, when we do planning and learning and memorizing, we really apply a much more complicated cycle. But the basic of it, the most fundamental aspect, is precisely the Zillard's engine. And the memory, in this case, is precisely the number of bits that we have to keep in our memory, in our brain, or wherever it is, uh, in order to act in a useful way. And again, what is nice about it, so first of all, this, uh, apparently this definition was uh, not mine. I mean, the, this is just one example. Joachim Fuster, who actually defined this, uh, this term, the perception action cycle, he didn't think about uh, Cano cycle or, or Zilla cycle, <laughs> but he said this particular sentence, that the perception action cycle is about the circular flow of information between an organism and its environment. And the question is, okay, if this is what it is about, what is the minimal information required for some valuable behavior? And that turned out to be a, a question you can actually begin to answer explicitly and, and quantitatively. And uh, to make a, a long story short, I'll just again tell, so what we think, what we are doing is, if we're thinking about this interaction between the memory and the world, so this is a simple extension of the picture that I showed you before. This is the world. It has some stochasticity. It has some uncertainty. If it doesn't have anything stochastic, by the way, you don't need information. Just, but there's always uncertainty, even, even if only in the initial conditions or the, the fact that you don't really know the precise state of the system. It, you have only finite memory of it. So there's always some sort of uncertainty, if, even if the world is completely deterministic. But usually the world is at least assumed to be stochastic. There's some sort of uncertainty we don't know that affect the dynamics. And the point is that we are measuring things, those observations at some point, and we are acting on the environment again by actions. And the crucial aspects are really what is the information here? What is the action here? What is the minimal information that I need to get in each of these uh, cycles? And then how, how is it putting a bound on my behavior? And again, without uh, getting into the mathematics, I, uh, which, I, which I simply don't have time if I wanted to, but we do have, as a result of our formalism, which is essentially a control theoretic-like formulation. I mean, it's some sort of a Bellman-like equation for the optimal behavior of the system. What we get is that the, the average reward, or actually the excess reward with respect to the average, times a, a Lagrange multiplier, which in our case we call beta, which actually is exactly one over kt of thermodynamics, is always bounded by two terms. 
One of them is how much information you actually have about the state of the world, which is precisely the Zillard information. And the other one was this funny term, which essentially how much, I can, how much information my action has on the next state of the world, conditioned on a previous state of the world. And you can think about it after some manipulation as some sort of memory, how much my memory of the world is maintained. And essentially what you see here, that if I don't erase my memory, which means I have more information about the next state of the world, I can gain more value. Now, this is very general, has nothing to do with thermodynamics. Has the, the special case of heat bath with Gibbs distribution and all that is a very specific and very simple special case of this. But this is a very general relationship. As long as the interaction with the environment is local, I mean, I would send thing and then act, this is a bound that has to be satisfied. And what really struck me just two months ago is that this is generalizing what you're very nicely compatible with this uh, Zillard, Brillouin, uh, not Brillouin, Landauer uh, um, uh, uh, term. As long as I interpret this, this is somehow related to memory erasure, but it's the information lost, not the work gain. In order to actually turn it into heat, I need to assume something else. I need to assume some sort of conservation of energy, which I don't have, I don't want to assume at this point. Okay, so. Believe me, that this, this story has been uh, worked out in many, many different settings, and, and it's, it's correct in some sense that it's generalizing our understanding of, uh, of interaction uh, with the world. But what turns out to be the, the dominant uh, function here is something which we call the predictive information of the system after taking into account the, the control and the sensing. So I can actually, once I know what my sensing is, and I know what my control or actions are, I can calculate how much information the memory of my organism can maintain from the past, which is valuable in the future. So how much you really need to know what is the minimum amount of information that you need to store from the past in order to achieve a certain amount of information about the future. Now, without confusing you right now about the difference between information and value, this is a long story. There are two aspects that I want to emphasize here which are very interesting for this calculation. So this function, this monotonically increasing function, is essentially how much informa information about the future in general I will have as a function of information that I stored from the past. And it has two beautiful and, and fascinating aspects that I want to emphasize here. One of them, it has a finite slope at the origin. This finite slope at the origin is fundamental. It's not just because I chose it. It has to do with with something which we usually call the information theory, the data processing inequality, it has to do with the fact that my memory is only a function of the past sensations, not the future. It doesn't predict directly the future to the sum. But this, it turns out that in this, in this Zillard Landauer story, this is directly related to the minimal temperature, exactly the point where you actually gain more than you lose in this cycle in terms of value. So since there is always some loss, there is a minimal complexity to my organism that generates uh, useful behavior, which means life will not emerge immediately. In order to actually spontaneously get a system which exploits this relationship with the environment, you need to pass a certain threshold of complexity, which in this case is one bit of memory, one bit of action, and one bit of, of, of behavior, of uh, sensing, but it uh, has to be tailored very, very clearly, carefully in. And I, I argue that this is directly related to this onset of complexity. The other story, which is the last part of my talk, and I really have very, very little time to get into it, but is, is okay, so if this is the beginning of evolution, I mean, you need some sort of fluctuation that will somehow miraculously will generate, but it can be a very, very simple system. I can now generate a system which essentially is made out of one molecule with some sort of two levels memory and one, uh, uh, and some sort of interaction which you can call sensing and acting with the environment in order to call it alive. So it's really a nanotechnology in its best. Of course, this will generate heat. It will not violate the second law of thermodynamics, but it will, it will behave in a useful manner for, its, for itself. Now, how can, why will it get more complicated than this? I mean, why, why do we actually have living organisms as complicated as us? Just slightly more complicated than that. <laughs> so uh, the reason is, that, again, a very fundamental information theoretic aspect of this analysis is that this type of curves always have what I call latent information about more. Actually, you always store more information than you need. There's always something in your memory that can tell you a little more than just the prediction of the next stage 
there's some redundancy of information, something which we sometimes call the density of information, is, is actually lower. There's always some sort of redundancy. We always know a little more. Now, I can give you a whole talk about it, but essentially it has to do with the fact that those states that remember the future are robust in some sense. If I now make a small fluctuation in the environment, they will still be able to adapt. And that has to do with the fact that I'm minimizing information as some sort of a maximum entropy distribution, which has the maximum width. And therefore, it's, it's least sensitive to fluctuations in the environment, which means that this system can adapt in some sense, that if I now change the environment a little bit, it will still be able to operate. It is not very, very tight, tightly linked with one state of the, system, of the environment. And that's actually quite surprising. It has to do with, again, the fact that the information that I have in the past is a lot larger than the information I have in the, in the future. It's usually orders of magnitude larger. The other thing is that in, that in order to actually extract more information about the future, I need to go through a cascade of transitions, which are, are now more and more understood in terms of what exactly happens there. Usually I need to essentially just splitting my memory into more pieces, like uh, adding more, more components to my memory. And these transitions are actually very non-trivial in the sense that if I don't make this decision, I'm going to stay on one of those lower branches without getting more complicated. But if, for some reason, I was able to adapt and then discover that with another bit, I can actually do better, I actually have to pass through this phase transition and get more involved and more complicated. So the, the intuition or the speculation that we have now is that really the very beginning of life can actually be explored quantitatively using relatively simple, or even too simple, mathematics, which is very analogous to thermodynamics, but it's not thermodynamics. It's about this moving out of equilibrium and then exploit the fluctuation by measurements and then get into a new state with memory. And if I have memory, even without the erasure of memory, I can, I can get more and more structure about the environment and learn more and more things. So actually this cascade of hierarchies, as we call them, I mean, phase transitions, this is maybe one link, uh, is, is something which I find very fascinating. It's also very important for the evolution of language. And this is just to tease you a little bit, but some of you know that I've been thinking about this for a long time. And, and it turns out that we do have such phase transitions in the most semantic and many semantic, and also probably syntactic structure of language, but we studied only the semantic aspects of it, in terms of emergence of new concepts and emergence of new words and so on, which happen to obey exactly the same type of laws. I mean, whenever there's something in the world which I need to describe in more, com in, in more elaborated way, I, I simply expand my memory or expand my language or descriptors of the world, and it turns out to obey exactly the same type of mathematics in some sense. Okay, I know this is uh, just a teaser, but I wanted to link it somehow with, uh, with language. So anyway, so uh, just to summarize, I don't have a good summary slide other than that there are many, many good people who contributed to my ideas. Uh, these are some of them, there are many more. But, uh, uh, and some of them disagree with me, but never mind, that's still contributed to my ideas. But uh, especially the, the Daniel Polani here, uh, and of course Eli and Bill Bialik uh, have been very, very, uh, uh, important, without them we couldn't really do anything here. But uh, the point is that I think we can dare say that this question of how life begins without any reference to molecular biology or what specific physical laws are there or anything is actually something which science can address. And not only how life begins, but how complexity of communication evolves because these two channels of how do you describe the sensory world and how do you describe their actions is really the basic components of what you call communication. Language is also all about that. I mean, how we describe nouns and verbs, if you want. And uh, I really believe that this is the fundamental, the very beginning of the story. So thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, Bill. How would you explain I don't know, by the first, by the third that I the difference, the basic difference between the heat generated by a supercomputer and our brain, that are orders of magnitude difference. How our brain is doing it in principle? 
working. Well, first of all, I don't try to explain it. But, uh, I mean, uh, but you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the limits, those fundamental physical limits are far beyond, actually not too far from the biological limits as far as we know today, in terms of energy required from sensing, let's say, our, the we are sensitive to single photons very efficiently in our eyes or things like this, but uh, very, very far from the efficiency of any artificial system today. This is really the biggest gap between artificial systems like computers and, and, uh, and even the simplest organism is the, the energy efficiency. And, and that's something we, it's not the speed and it's not the capacity of memory and not, nothing like that, it's the energy efficiency. So artificial systems today are extremely inefficient. Tens, oh, not tens, but many orders of magnitude. Uh, then, um, and this is really the, the biggest barrier for moving ahead with computers today is the energy consumption and the heat <laughs> generated. And, and, and uh, as, as we know today, this is, uh, actually we have absolutely no idea. If you think, for example, of the efficiency of, the, of a fly, something you, you may like. I mean, uh, in terms of energy efficiency, how does it fly with so little energy in terms of the relationship between sensing and, and behavior of this simple, not so simple, organism compared to anything we know how to do, the orders of magnitude gaps. And I think this is really the greatest technological challenge. But at least we know that down there, there are fundamental physics bound physical bound which have to do with the thermodynamics of the system. So conceptually, I think this, are, this is a very important way of thinking about it. I'd like to make a short comment about how animals are able to extract useful energy from random movement. Sowing birds in a turbulent wind, wind field exactly do this. You watch them in a, in a, in a wind. And they just it up by yeah, I think this is a beautiful example. I, I need you here for, for that stack of stories. Again, flies. I don't know how many of you saw some of these recent movies. On there's a nice movie of Attenborough yeah, on on the on the development of uh, of flight. And there is a nice chapter there on, on, on flies, which I find fascinating. So flies in particular can do exactly what you do. I mean, they can turn over, flip over, do all sorts of things, using the turbulent air around them for their benefit in a way which we don't know how to do. They cannot fly without this wind. Yeah. Okay, never mind. I mean, this is a whole long story, but it just tells us that maybe, I mean, there's actually a deep relationship between this fundamental physics and, and information theory and biology, which we all need to know. That's essentially the main, me main message here. Yes, Chava. Uh, if I understand correctly, what you are describing basically uh, when you're talking about evolution is that one has to focus on the evolution of homeostasis. Yes. Increased homeostasis, in fact, and at, at, at some point... That, that, that quasi-statically, in some sense, the system is adapting itself optimally, and then do small changes along this curve, and as long as the changes in the environment are small, I can, I can follow it. Yes. Yeah. And at some point, there is the jump. So, I, and so this, yeah, so what one would assume then that really the best way of going about uh, uh, following evolutionary history, from your point of view, is really to study the evolution of memory. This would give us a very good clue as to evolution, to evolutionary transitions, for example, and things like that. Yeah, when you say memory, it's a, it's a bit, maybe too yeah. much. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's what they're doing. We're looking at our brain and yeah. we study memory. Yeah, memory but, uh, at the level of cells. Yeah, but I think that we have to, we don't have to war, I think we really have to push more towards what I call elementary processes, yeah, sure. in some yeah. sense. What simplest excitation or event that stimulate simplest possible memory, one bit of memory, and see how this behaves, and, and this okay. is... To say uh, that one of the important evolutionary biologists today, uh, Mary, West, uh, Mary Jane West Eberhardt, is very much uh, from a very different uh, perspective, is following this kind of thinking too by saying that for, uh, a phenotypic plasticity, this ability to respond to more than it is supposed to, it's not a registered, phenotypic plasticity is a primitive of life. And I think this goes very much in the direction that you're suggesting. I completely agree. I mean, this ability to adapt slow, this notion of quasi-static changes, even in this non-equilibrium system. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.